Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great seeing you all here. So today I just wanted to talk to you about some studies that we have here looking at yield and protein relationship. And I think this is uh, something that we are going to need to pay more and more attention on wheat. So when we talk about end use quality in wheat, uh, we consider that protein is like the tip of the iceberg of end use quality. So although we have several characteristics involved in that end use quality, protein is usually a good indicator of a good quality wheat and a good uh, bread making characteristics of the flour. So usually the, uh, the greater amount of protein in the grain, the greater the, the end use characteristics of the flour. And so there has been that notion that uh, to plant a variety with good quality, we need to give up on yield. But um, efforts from current breeding programs has been showing that and indicating that may be changing. And so there might be some varieties out there and that are good in both yield and protein. And I think we need to pay attention on that. And so there is a negative relationship in between yield and protein, and there is no doubt about it. So what you see here in this data, uh, this is data from variety trials in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So we have more than 4,000 data points here. And what you see here in the data points are uh, varieties under intensive and standard management practice. So basically intensive is just an additional nitrogen and fungicide application. And what you see here, it's protein concentration in the grain on the y-axis and yield on the x-axis in this negative trend uh, in, in this relationship. But what you also see here is that those data points above this line here are all the intensive management saying that in, uh, we can lessen the, this negative relationship through management, especially uh, nitrogen. However, that is... Uh, that is not not all the our solutions are not all about management so we can see that even within that same management practices we have data points here that vary so there is a strong genetic in a generic uh genetic in a genetic by environment uh component on that relationship so one of the studies that we, we are conducting here at Oklahoma is uh, this study here, uh, I'm working with Dr. Arnau. So we are looking at two locations in four varieties. So basically they are a pair of varieties. So a pair that is like both high yield and high protein in a pair that is a high yield, but average to low protein. And we are looking at those varieties under zero and 120 pounds of nitrogen applied uh, per hectare per acre. And what we see here in those varieties is that, so here we have no nitrogen applied, so there is no significant difference among varieties in yield. And when nitrogen is applied also, we did not see any significant uh, difference in yield among this variety. So this is one year of data, so just keep that in mind. And we are still collecting data for this study. But when we look at comparison of the nitrogen rate, we see that yield almost doubled from zero to 120 pounds of nitrogen applied per acre. And when we look at the protein and yield relationship, we can see here, so we have grain protein concentration here on the y-axis and yield on the x-axis. And you can see here at the zero end, even when no nitrogen is applied, just that natural uh, nitrogen coming from, from the soil, we see that variety is different in protein. So here we have uh, Gallagher and Iba, and here is double stop in uh, green hammer. And, and you can see a significant increase in, in protein for those varieties. And, and very interesting is that even when no nitrogen is applied at the zero end, and when no, it like those varieties here that has the same protein level when no nitrogen is applied than some other varieties here when nitrogen was applied. So very interesting that just that genetic component of those varieties in the ability to produce protein even when no uh, fertilizer is applied. 
And so one of the things that we look to here, trying to understand what are the intrinsic uh, characteristics of those varieties that are able to produce better yield and also protein. So we collected biomass during the growing season. So this is a preliminary data here showing no difference in plant growth during the growing season. So we have, uh, we collected samples at jointing, heading soft to dough and harvest. And you see here the lines there overlapping most of the time uh, at the zero nitrogen and when we applied that full end rate. And so varieties at the zero and they did not differ in growth. And here we see a trend for maybe green hammer having a higher biomass than especially IBA here, but it's just a trend in, and they were not statistically significant. And so that's why we are going to continue looking at it. So varieties did not differ in growth during the growing season. And when we look at the nutrient accumulation during the growing season, again, we do not see any difference here among varieties during the growing season at the zero nitrogen. And at the full end rate, we also see that trend for green hammer, especially late in the season, having a greater uptake, a trend, of course, because the lines here is still overlapping. So they're not statistically significant, but we see a trend, especially when looking at here, green hammer in comparison to IBA here uh, with a lower nitrogen accumulation during the season. So uh, this is something that we are still interested on and, and still looking at it and trying to understand whether those varieties now different in, in the ability to accumulate nutrient in uh, different plant components. So more data will be coming soon. Another study that I wanted to show you today, it's uh, one of our variety trials from last year in Homestead. So here we could clearly see the difference in varieties in, in what we say leaf health, that being due to environment, due to diseases. So some varieties were just hammered by all factors present in that location while some varieties were not. And so this variety trial in Homestead last year was uh, one of the highest yielding or the better yielding uh, location in the variety trials ever in Oklahoma. So the average yield was 107 bushels an acre, but we had some varieties that hit that 121 bushels an acre, 120 or so. And when we look at that, that relationship here, so here we have grain yield and we have protein. We see that for some varieties, there is that difference. While the greater the yield, the lower the, the protein, but for some varieties not. So you see here, especially here, uh, that shaded values with the both high yield and high protein. And so when we look at the relationship in between protein and yield for that data, you can see that, uh, let's say here, the average yield again, 107 bushels, and we draw a line here for protein, uh, varieties that were both above average in yield and protein, fall, uh, they fall here in this quadrant number two. So what I wanted to emphasize with this data again is that Yes, there is that negative relationship in between protein, but some varieties, they are able to produce good, good yield and good protein. So we have those genetics out there and it's something that we need to pay attention to. And when, when we draw a line here for protein, considering that premium or that baseline as a 12%, we also see that we have some varieties here in this quadrant that are above average yield and also above, above that baseline of protein of 12%. And another data set here that, that I looked at was uh, looking at varieties that were grown in, six, in, in, in the same environments across our variety trials here in Oklahoma last year. So we had varieties that were grown in 16 environments. So we had about seven varieties that were grown in all those locations. So looking at their yield potential is uh, relative to the environmental, to the average of each environment. So basically what you're looking here in this data is the, the mean average yield of each variety and the 
and the average yield of each environment. So this dash line here represents the one one line, meaning that varieties or lines that fall on top of that one one line, they yielded the same as the average of the environment. And the more inclined that line is, it means that they are more responsive to the environment. So for example, here, this blue line means that this variety may not be the best at low yielding environment, but it's very responsive in high yielding environments. And varieties here that fall, follow the parallel to that one one line means that they are widely adapted. They perform just like the environment. But when we look here uh, at the protein concentration, we can see that some lines, they switch place. So they were on top and now they are in the bottom and or they become less responsive to 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 the protein and so this was uh it's it's interesting to look at uh, varieties that they might switch places or varieties they continue on that parallel line just like uh the yield so so that is something that we should look at the environmental effect on that protein concentration in yield and as we know, there is a year-to-year -year variation in, in this relationship. And so one of the things here that we looked at was the three-year data in the Lahoma regional trial. So basically what you're seeing here is the three years of data. So the bars representing the yield of each variety in each year. And here we have the yield deviation. So just meaning that, bars or values that are on the right side of this line, this vertical line, mean, mean that uh, a variety yielded more than the average of the environment. And bars that are on the left side of this vertical line mean that a variety yielded less than the average of the environment. And you can see here that some varieties, they yielded consistently more than the average yield of the environment in those three years. And some varieties, they varied more. So we have like some years that you did better, some years that were just like the environment and some years that were less than the environment. And when we look at protein, it's the same trend, although some varieties, they show that stability in those three years of data that we analyzed. And uh, for example, here, double stop showing a, a consistent uh, greater average yield and greater average protein uh, as compared to or relative to the environment. And let's say here, Greenhammer also showing a uh, greater uh, than average, but some years here varying a little bit is likely uh, below the, the average here in yield or just as like the, the environment. And so I think the, the way that the, the baking and milling industry is becoming more vocal in, on the varieties that they prefer, I think this is something that we need to pay attention to. There are varieties out there that have both good yield and good protein, and it's something that we need to continue investing on uh, to stay competitive. So we can lessen that negative relationship between yield and protein through management up to a certain point. There is that, we cannot forget that there is that genetic and GBI effect on this relationship. And so understanding the quality characteristics of the varieties and what end users are looking for may help us to, to stay competitive. And so with that, I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Amanda. Do you have any, does anybody have any questions for uh, Dr. Silva? We have plenty of time here. Do you have any private messages, direct messages coming through, Amanda? Oh, wait, let me see. Yeah, check on that one. Hey, I, I've got a question here that comes up or where uh, I'm asked occasionally and looking at the varieties that you looked at, most of them seem to be more newer varieties. Has anybody looked at some of the, uh, we get questions about, I don't want to say heirloom varieties, but older varieties. And the thought being that they are more efficient with uh, the environment and making both protein and, and not necessarily yield, but that there is less of an environmental impact is what's always presented to us. Is there anything that you all have looked at on those older varieties that would say that's true or not true so you get questions 
Let me just see if I understand here. So you get questions uh, whether the older varieties are more efficient or it's like people are saying, oh, they are more efficient or, you know, you're curious if comparing to, to the newer varieties, they're less right. or, yeah. Right, so right. I think, okay, so I think the, the newer varieties are more efficient from data that I have seen from other research studies because they have higher yield with less or the same amount uh, than the older varieties. So I tend to think that the newer varieties are more efficient. They can produce more with less. That's my, my perspective and experience with a few data that I have looked at. Okay, and, and let me back up here. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I probably missed, missed, I asked that question wrong. They're looking at it primarily from an input driven side where they can cut nitrogen and, and try and eliminate the inputs and mm -hmm. they're willing to give up that yield, but they end up gaining the protein back, if that makes sense. Yes. Because yes. those older varieties have a better environmental relationship to protein. That's, I guess, more what I was trying, where I was trying to go with that. Okay. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> we can look more into that, Caleb. We have some old, uh, mm -hmm. like Green Hammer and such, came from a run of six hundred lines in Tipton that had some older lines. But we can also look at the long terms. I mean, we've got one hundred and twenty-five years of data from a Gruder twenty-eight, and another one hundred and ninety site years from a long term. So we go back fifty to seventy years in cultivars. Um, from what I remember, and this is just talking off my memory, the relationship with high yield and pro, or, or nutrients and protein, low, low nitrogen, low protein, went all the way back to, to uh, 100 years ago. But I, I'll have okay. to dig more into that. No, that's fine. That's just something we, I, I have heard from several producers. So I was just yeah. curious about Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll put it this way, Caleb. So even on the new cultivars, on a lot of my students' work, when you under-fertilized, you ended up, and this will go back to a lot of stuff in Madison, you, you end up with actually a smaller berry and higher nitrogen concentration. So the under-fertilized crop in in-rate response studies may have a higher protein in regards to the cultivar because it's gone under other stresses. And so you don't have the same uh, test weight and it's a, it's a right. dilution effect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.